When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in Timnaherez, in the hill country of Ephraim, upon the mountain of Gash. And all that generation also were gathered with fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the vows. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them and bowed down to them. They provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies, so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Where, whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned, and as the Lord had sworn to them. And they were in terrible distress. Then the Lord raised up the witches who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they poured after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them, and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he said, Because of this people have transgressed my covenant that I had commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their father did or not. So the Lord left those nations, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. Now those who the nations of the Lord left to test Israel by them, that is, all of Israel who have not experienced all wars of Canaan, it was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war, to teach war to those who had not known it before. These are the nations, the five lords of the Philistines, and all the Canaanites, and the Sidonites, and the Hivites, who lived on Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal Hermon, as far as Labo Hamad. They were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Parasites, the Hivites, the Hivites, and their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served their gods. Number two, to curse those who worship other gods. There's a critical mass, I'm not sure what it is, in numbers in the United States, but there is certainly a critical mass at which 
you reach, that your nation begins to fall under God's judgment. America started as a Christian nation. And um, it doesn't mean that you have to be born uh, a Christian to be part of a Christian nation. As long as the people who run the nation obey God and make godly policies and laws, everybody within the nation gets blessed. It's only when people who are running your nation who begin to worship other gods do we break faith with God's commandments, the Ten Commandments, and we begin to have them actually violated against us because the only religion on the planet Earth that will treat people according to the Ten Commandments is biblical Christianity. Uh, here's our message map for today. We're going to look at uh, five things. The, the, the name of this last message is Conviction Keeps Us on Top of the Cycle. And I want to add to convert within the context or the cultural context. I wrote a book called The Three-Dimensional Leader, Negotiating Your Mission, Resources, and Context. And um, it's based on the leadership styles in the book of Judges. So I decided, uh, well, I wanted to do 1 Corinthians, but I felt the Lord telling me to do this. So after Joshua. Maybe we'll get to 1 Corinthians afterwards. But anyway, we're gonna see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain what the cycle is in Judges. There's about eight of them. Some people say there are 13. Uh, although some of them are not uh, explained or highlighted, but there's 13 different judges. And the challenge for Israel is when a judge does the right thing, the nation gets blessed. When your leaders do the wrong thing, the nation gets cursed. So we're going to look at how in jo Judges 2.10, there arose another generation that neither knew Joshua or Caleb or what the Lord had done for Israel. That's a pretty powerful statement. I'm going to explain why that is a huge challenge for people. Uh, we're going to look at Judges 2.12, how every generation, each generation, uh, must know the work God has done for the nation. In Judges 2.16-19, we're going to actually look at one of the cycles. There's, the cycle is the nation enters into sin, goes into servitude because of sin. Because of the pain of suffering and hardship, they sob, they cry out for solace, and God sends them salvation. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of ways to look at that cycle. We're going to look at, look at it actually from three ways today. But that's a cycle. that, And nations go through it. The Old Testament contains the processes of the principles that are explained in the New Testament. The fourth thing we're going to look at are how there are three dimensions of roles and responsibilities of judges. There are three types of judges, basically. And I say the leaders must focus on their MRCs, their mission, resources, and context. I was running government programs when I realized uh, that uh, realized this. There's a leadership template in the in the Bible in the Book of Judges. Uh, the fifth thing we're going to look at is how we must respond to God's conviction to stay on top of that cycle. So the concept of a biblical judge is one who is supposed to be a keeper of God's law. You've got to get the who right to get the do right, because the who's are going to do. We saw in Joshua that God said, I'm displacing the who's, the people that are in that land, because they are doing things that my word says is an abomination. And there is a um, pattern that scripture shows that societies go through. You worship idols, you abuse children, you institutionalize homosexuality. God comes down and blows the place up himself. America's doing this right now. So we're calling, we're trying to call our nation to repentance. The judge doesn't just play church. The judge executes God's laws in civic society. You know, the Bible says in Deuteronomy and Numbers and Leviticus, God says, I want my commandments hung on your doorpost, hung on the lamppost. There's supposed to be a public acknowledgement. America's forefathers made a covenant with God called the Mayflower Compact. And they actually began to live that way. They fled Europe because they wanted to be able to practice the Bible in civics publicly. And they came here. As I said, you don't have to be born a Jew to participate in Old Testament Israel's covenant. Like Rahab, all you have to do is agree to participate in it. Like the Gibeonites, the entire nation of Gibeonites, just agree to participate in it. God grafts you in. He was showing us the pattern of salvation in Christ. You can be born a sinner, but I, can, I will graft you in to the covenant.
And through Christ, we actually are part participating in the new covenant. So I don't even like to think anymore in terms of an Old Testament and a New Testament because the Old Testament shows us all the processes that God is going to work for us in the New Testament. It's not like one ends and the other begins. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish. I came to fulfill. We got to remember there's two parts of God's Old Testament law. There's the ceremonial law that Christ fulfilled through his death, burial, and resurrection. And then there's the moral law, the eternal law that is never going to go away, which is in the Ten Commandments and other places. So, like Old Testament Israel, America's forefathers applied the Bible to civics. They applied the Bible to every aspect of life. And uh, they created what's, what, is, what has become known as a Christian nation, which we are rapidly losing sight of. So, I could ask this question. Now that we know what America's forefathers were doing, were they acting sort of in the roles of Old Testament judges? When they figured out what God wanted us, to, how God wants us to live in civics? Some people say no. Some people might say yes. Was God using America's founders in a way similar to how he used Old Testament judges? When he inspired them to craft a country that has in its founding documents in the Declaration of Independence that we have unalienable rights that come from our creator. Thomas Aquinas, uh, John Locke, Hobbes, Montesquieu tell us that those rights are your Ten Commandments Decalogue rights. We all have a Ten Commandment number six right to not be murdered. We all have a Ten Commandment number seven right to not be sexually molested. Or if you're a young child, uh, if you're a school aged child now, I always tell people, go tell your teachers and your guidance de uh, department and your principals and the people in school that I have a Ten Commandment number seven right to self identify as the males and females that God has made us. Somebody has to stand up and tell the truth, or the truth will not be known. We have a Ten Commandment number eight right not to be stolen from. I could go on. We have a ten, ten Commandment number one through four right to worship God publicly the way he says he wants to be worshipped. Well, today we're going to look at the Bible's book of Judges to see um, why did Israel and all nations, leaders or judges, need to focus on God's will? What happens if you don't? We're going to look at what the roles and responsibilities are of an Old Testament judge and how they parallel the roles and responsibilities of people today, of leaders today. Whether you're in a private company, a government company, or whether you're uh, in a not-for-profit organization, the roles of leaders really are the same. Negotiate, focus on the organization's mission, use the organization's resources to fulfill the mission, but understand the context in which you have to deploy those resources so you know how to deploy them to fulfill the mission. It's a very simple paradigm. We're going to look at the outcomes of nations, and especially in our beloved USA, how the outcome is dependent upon what the leaders do. At as a leader, we should be praying, Lord, I want to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit because if I don't have your conviction, if your conviction is not on, on, upon me, I'm not going to stay on top of that cycle. I'm going to end up in sin and judgment. Well, if you're new to Liberty Christian Fellowship, you have blanks in your page. On the next slide, you'll see blue, uh, blue words, and you can fill, use those words as your fill-in. These are the words I would fill in. You can fill in whatever you want. Each generation must know the Lord and the works God, the work is God has done for Israel. So, can you imagine this? Joshua is leading the people of Israel and God parts the Jordan. Before that, he parted the Red Sea. He led them in the wilderness by a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. Can you imagine a generation later, they're saying, what? God had nothing to do with our country. What are you talking about? And if you were the parent, if you were God of those children, I think you'd put them in a little time out. <laughs> You know what America is suffering from today? Spiritual amnesia. We don't know where we came from. People don't talk about the biblical basis of our Bill of Rights anymore. I don't know if they ever did. I made up that term, but I got it from reading our Founding Fathers' works. 
They talk about conservatism. They say we're a nation of laws. Well, I've been in some Muslim countries. They are nations of laws too, not laws you'd want to live under. Doesn't, it, laws are not the issue. It's what your laws are based upon are the issue. They didn't know the work that the Lord had done for Israel. What are the, what is, what is, what is, what are the works that God did for Israel? Well, he started out with the, the plagues and, uh, at the Passover. It really starts way before then in Genesis, but I'm not going to get into all that right now. But as, as far as Exodus is concerned, it starts with the plagues and the Passover that God used to set the uh, Israelites free. The fact that the nation of Israel could be in slavery for 400 years and still have an identity as the people of God is a testament to how God promised Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. The world always attacks that nation, but it still remains a people identified as the people of God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. What else did God do for Israel? Well, he destroyed Pharaoh's army in the sea. I remember once we tried to use some helicopters during the Iran-Contra crisis to go and rescue some hostages and the helicopters crashed in the desert. We have a president now that seems to be doing things a bit more God's way and our military operations are more successful. If you've ever been in the military and have been in training exercises where there's smoke being thrown and bullets are going or, and there's fire, it's chaos. You need the blessings of God to survive that environment and to hit the right targets. God has to help us. He helped our founding fathers take on the greatest power on, on the planet and uh, give us freedom. Anyway, God provided manna for them in the wilderness. You know that Israel's clothes did not wear out in 40 years and their sandals didn't wear out? He parted the Jordan for them. During flood season, he brought down the walls of Jericho and he, made, he extended daylight when they were in the Battle of Ai. And one generation later, people are saying, what are you talking about? God never helped us. What are you talking about? We're not a biblical nation. So our goal in this generation is to remind people of what God has done. What has he done for us in this modern time? Well, he sent Christ to be born of a virgin, to live a sinless life, to die a substitutionary death to be bodily resurrected, and to be seated at the right hand of God. He inspired America's founding fathers and their descendants to become pro-Testament people in, in, in Europe and say, you know what, we're not playing the church's game. We read what the Bible says, and we want to be biblical people. The word Protestant originally meant pro-Testament. We want to live what the Bible says. So Europe kind of rejected that. They started an Anglican church, which was very much like the Catholic church that was persecuting the Christians and praying to Mary and praying the things that the Bible says you can't pray to. So the Puritans, God sent the Puritans to America and they began to apply the Bible in civics. And then the pilgrims followed them. And God inspired them to write the Declaration of Independence. I've already explained why that's such an important... You know, you're never going to understand the Declaration of Independence in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution and the Mayflower Compact unless you read them as Christian doctrinal statements of how the Bible applies to civics. Because we have been duped by a concept called separation of church and state. Which kind of communicates to people that the Bible has no relevance to our civics. Which really translated has no rele rele relevance to your personal life. Because the civics will crush you if you don't live the way the civics want you to live in most countries. They gave us freedom of religion. That was a great blessing. They put in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution freedom of religion and freedom of speech next to each other. You know, the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution confines, combines five rights, five activities. You got freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom to assembly, assemble, and freedom to redress the government of gre for your grievances. And the reason they put freedom of speech and religion and speech together is because the founding fathers were born again Christians who took Jesus' great commission commands seriously. And they said, we haven't been allowed to do that in Europe. We've done it. But it cost many, many people their lives doing it in Europe under Catholicism. And we are now going to come to a place where we can be free and we're going to, put, we're going to codify God's will for our lives. 
So many people were burned at the stake just because they wanted to put the Bible into the vernacular of their people. Anybody attacking the Bible, you can tell they're in a religion that they may call themselves Christian, but if they're attacking the Bible, their religion is not biblical. If you really read the Bible, you wouldn't be part of that religion. So they suppress it. If you have, Jesus said, worship me in spirit and truth. If you have spirit and truth, you don't need a whole lot of accoutrements to do church. Holy Spirit works through the word of God. But if you don't have spirit and truth, you better get big cathedrals and people in $10,000 robes and all this gold and glitter to make up for the fact that you don't have spirit and truth, trying to convince people that you're religious. The Founding Fathers gave us a tremendous act called the Satan Deluder Act where they put the Bible in public schools. If you ever get a, 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 a copy of the um, New England Primer, it does the alphabet according to the Bible. A is for Adam, B is for Bible, C is for Christ. You ever go get a copy of the 1828, which you can get online, the first dictionary of the American English language? It actually defines many words by how they appear in the Bible. Got the Bible verses right in there. But people today say, we're, we're never a Christian nation! Hey, if we don't obey God's Ten Commandments, you're going to end up obeying man's Ten Thousand Commandments. Because they're going to keep making rules that are going to suppress and suppress and suppress. Alright, let's move on. How does society sink into slim sin? The book of Judges records 325 years of ups and downs for the nation. How the how the society sinks into sin. We read that, right? And then God sends someone to remind the people, hey, wait a minute, we're the people of God. We're supposed to be doing things a particular way. The Bible says we are a peculiar people. Society sink into sin by what Chuck Swindoll says are the three causes of failure, societal failure, institutional failure, incomplete obedience, just partially obey. Do you know that you can break all the Ten Commandments except number one, and number two. You could break all the commandments and go to heaven except number one and number two. If I say my higher power is this tablet or my guitar, I'm not getting to heaven. I may fool my alcohol and drug counselor though, <laughs> but I'm not going to get to heaven. <laughs> the tablet did not die for my sins. <laughs> Idolatry. It's amazing how much of the Bible is committed to trying to get people to understand. If you pray to and expect the um, responses of deity from anything other than God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's idolatry. And I don't care if they do it in the name of Christ. Jesus is having none of it. I have a program I teach called the politics that pollute paradise. And you can track the personalities and their religion who have gotten into our government and look at the decisions that they have made to suppress biblical Christianity in the name of conservatism. And we're a nation of laws. Finally, the Bible talks about intermarriage. I had a friend, a very dear friend, who would fix all my electrical gear, my, our musical gear. And he would tell me about twice a year, he goes, you know, I don't agree with your your interracial marriage, you being black and your wife being white. And uh, I would say, well, that's not what the Bible's talking about. Moses' wife was swarthy. She was black. Um, Rahab was from one group of people, and she, she married another guy in Israel, and she gets grafted in, and she's actually in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. I always think about Rahab, and the Bible calls her a harlot from, from, uh, from uh, Joshua to Revelation. And I'm like, well, why do you keep doing that? God is kind of, I don't want people to know what I used to be. But the Lord reminds me, he goes, you should never forget where God has brought you from. This, we don't want to have spiritual amnesia. Amen? Now, I'm not going to walk around and call you old sinner or whatever you used to be, but you know what the Holy Spirit works in us. He's how, he's, how he's changed us and where he's brought us from. Well, here's the thing. Francis of, of Assisi, I believe it was, wrote a book in the first century called The City of God. And in that book, he says that God over the history of the Bible is that God overthrows the nations because of idol worship. God actually considers those who worship idols his enemies. He calls us that. He calls them that in the Bible. The whole book, he de dedicates a lot of the Old Testament trying to illustrate that. All right, let's move on. 
What is this thing? Here's my main, here's, my, here's the main thing I want to get across to us today. There are three types of leaders. A leader is supposed to do three things. A leader is supposed to focus on mission. Mission matters most. The organization has hired you to do some things. Do those things. Don't do other things. But a lot of people are one-dimensional leaders. One-dimensional leadership is all about me, not the mission. This is a productivity, a rough productivity chart. You know, productivity is out here and up here so it goes this way you know if you, the more successful you are the more you're gonna be up and when I if you want to draw a quadrant it's what I call the right high the high right quadrant we want to be high right quadrant people we want to be people that understand the mission we want to be we want to be people that that take every resource that God puts in our hands and we want to use it to fulfill the mission but our challenge is there's a context there there is a chessboard there is a series of events there is a political atmosphere there are laws there are rules it, it's a context in which you have to figure out what is the context how will it determine that I deploy my resources in such a way so that they fulfill the mission you do all three you get productivity. One-dimensional leaders don't do it. Samson's a one-dimensional leader. It's all about me, not the mission. Two-dimensional leaders, they kind of get the, the one and the two right, but they're short-sighted. They don't, they're not as successful because they don't understand the context in which they are deploying their resources. One-dimensional leaders do things based on what I know. Two-dimensional leaders based the th do things based on what on, on who I know. And three-dimensional leaders do things based on what needs to be known. I got a 398 page book I'm packing out here for you, making it, trying to make it very simple. Now, in, in Old Testament Israel, where you see one dimensional leadership, the nation is controlled by an enemy. During Saul's time, the nation was controlled by the enemy. The Bible says in at least two places that I can find during this time that nobody in Israel had a sword. That's gun control. The nation is controlling us. I mean, the enemy's controlling the nation. They got swords. People over, I do these programs ar around the world, and people from uh, other countries, they say, well, the UN should take everybody's guns. I tell the Nigerians from Africa, well, let, why don't they start with Boko Haram? Mm -hmm. If a news reporter could go and interview Boko Haram, I think my GPS could find them if I had the sophisticated tools and weapons that the, that the UN and America has. Why don't they go take their guns? Go take their guns. As a matter of fact, the only tribes in Africa that have been able to defend themselves against Boko Haram, they raided a Boko Haram um, armory, or they attacked the caravan and took those weapons. The founding fathers of America knew that in Ten Commandment number six, we have the right, God gives us in Ten Commandment number six, the right to not be murdered. He theref they therefore gave us the, the second amendment right to defend yourselves. This is the best system of government that, to deal with sinners. Rose Rousseau said, well, we don't want people in charge of the government who believe other people are going to hell. They're not going to treat people well. Well, I believe you're going to hell, but I also believe that Jesus loves you. We do want people in charge of our government who believes that Jesus loves you, and we want to give you the opportunity to go to heaven. So we don't suppress any religion here. The Muslims ask me all the time overseas, Mr. Wallace, if what you're saying is true, how come you don't outlaw all the other religions? I said, I don't have to. In a fair and open discussion, you already admitted that if your slot and all the things you do fall short when you stand before God, if your bad outweighs your good, you want God to let you in because you are sincere. Since I could be sincerely wrong, but let's just work with your sincerity. You're asking God to give you grace and mercy because you are sincere. The Jews do the same thing. All the Catholics go supposed to go to purgatory. Why? When Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I'm not going, my mom used to say, you're wishing in one hand and you're pooping in the other. Which hand's going to fill up first? <laughs> I said, tell her what my friend said. She goes, your friend's, his behind is no Bible. Why are you swearing by him? <laughs> anyway. One-dimensional leadership is all about me, not the mission. Two-dimensional leaders, they tend to talk mission well, and they tend to put together good teams, but they micromanage them because the leader doesn't see this out here, so they limit the teams by what they know. These people limit the teams by what they don't know. Success requires rallying the resources to God's mission and deploying them to convert within the context. Let's move on. Samson. Here's what, how do people get, how do how do boneheads get into 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 leadership? Well, they got good personalities and they got 
good gifts and talents. And Samson was a great warrior, killed a thousand people. I mean, who wouldn't want the guy? But he was a lousy leader. You know, he is such, he, I'm going to, I don't want to get ahead of myself. We're going we're gonna to go through this in the book of Judges. But at one point, Samson is so useless to the organization, they tie him up and turn him over to the enemy. It's all part of the plan. He breaks the ropes. And he, but that's how useless he is to the organization. His walk was very crooked. The organization did not benefit, grow, develop, or profit from his efforts. He intermarried to someone of the wrong faith. And he became unequally yoked, according to 2 Corinthians 6.14. And he gave secrets. The, he gave the secret that God gave him that made the diff, all the difference in his life to the organization's enemies. And this downfall was from his own self-inflicted wounds. Sin is a mocker, the Bible says. Sin is, your, sin is our enemy. The Bible's not my enemy. The Bible convicts me. The Bible calls me names at times. It says you're a sinner, you're a liar, you're a cheat, you're a this, you're a... But it's only doing so because it's trying to save me. And because it's true. Hmm? And because it's true. <laughs> because it's true. <laughs> I always like the vote of confidence I get. <laughs> Where else? <laughs> <laughs> That's why we don't give ourselves the title of like the most holy reverend. The reverend is not a biblical title. There's nobody more revered than anybody else. Revered. We all fall short. All come, yeah. All of those inclusive words all have fallen short. All right, let's move on. You get those feelings? Let's, uh, let's move on. Now, Samuel is an example. I didn't, know, I didn't think I had any of these slides automated. Yeah. Oh, this one is. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Samuel was the last of the judges, and he's, I categorize him as a two-dimensional leader. He was righteous and competent. He, he knew enough about God's will to anoint Saul and then to anoint David, but he never makes a succession plan between the two. He failed to see the big picture, picture of how the mission has to, be, has to uh, unfold within a particular context, and he empowered the wrong resources. He puts his two corrupt sons in charge of the priestly mission. They are the wrong resources for the mission. Just go read 1 Samuel uh, 8, 1 through 4. It's amazing how God compacts so many things into a, into a, a couple of verses. Don't call Paul. <laughs> And don't call him Baldy. <laughs> you got to read that story in the Bible. It's really cool. Some kids are mocking him and calling him Baldy. What, they get eaten by a lion or a bear or something? <laughs> um, the challenge with two-dimensional leaders is they can't, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of commissioners and, 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 uh, and, other, and the directors. And, whatnot, and what happens is somebody gets promoted and they say, wow, I was really good doing that. So now that I'm over five different units who have five different functions, really, I'm going to make them all behave like the last place where I was successful. That is the wrong thing to do. Each of those organizations have its, they have their own mission. They have their own inner culture that's been worked out to how they operate to fulfill the mission. Your job as a leader is to say, hmm, how do my people work? What are the rules governing our work? How do we pass paperwork from one place to another and get the ball around all the bases? You, I, I'm going to make a deal with you that works for the way my people have to work. The challenge with two-dimensional leaders is they can't coordinate to get multiple groups of people on the same page to achieve the mission. You've got to do it your way. You've got to do it your unit's way. But together, we, we fulfill the mission. We do it the organization's way. All right. Now, other challenge with two-dimensional leaders is that they deploy the same strategy regardless of the situation. Israel says, we couldn't conquer those people because they had iron chariots. And the first time I read that, I was in the military. I said, just drag them down, tr trick them to come into the marsh. Bog those chariots down. You can negotiate the context and figure out a way to defeat those chariots. This is called functional, functionally fixed. You fail to see the alternative strategic uses of the resources. I learned that in college. I went to I signed up for this experiment and they gave you a screwdriver, a piece of wire that was too short, uh, a terminal and a battery. And the terminal had a light. So all you had to do was get the, 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 the wire to go between the battery and the light and the light would come on and you, you, you win the experiment. Well, and they gave you clay. Well, 
the clay is not a conductor and the screwdriver was too short to bridge between the wire which you would hook onto the terminal and to the light bulb you you could you you couldn't do it so I'm, i started to take the, the 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 housing of the light bulb apart to move it closer and they said no you couldn't do that yeah i take that back the screwdriver would have worked had I, but I, I was functionally fixed. To me, a screwdriver is something you use to take things apart and put things together. I didn't see the screwdriver as a conductor. All I had to do was take the wire, touch it to the screwdriver, and touch the other, the other end of the screwdriver, tip to the terminal, and the light would have gone on. But I was functionally fixed. I did not see the alternative use of the screwdriver. It was a life lesson for me. Anyway, let's move on. Deborah is an example of a three-dimensional leader. Deborah understands the mission and she rallies the resources to God's mission at the tree of Deborah. She also know, knew there's probably two or three good ways to do something. So if somebody wants to do something a particular way, I'm not going to micromanage the way. Do it your way. Just get it done. The general, Barack, says, I ain't going to go unless you go with me. She's like, okay, I'll go with you. And people used to always say to me, well, Barack shouldn't have done that. I'm like, huh, she's the boss. She's the prophet. If the prophet tells me, go over there and punch that guy in the nose, I want the prophetess to come and stand with me while I punch the guy in the nose. Otherwise, I won't believe the prophet told me that. Right? The military way is, come on, we're taking the hill. The military way is not, you guys go up there and take the hill. Barack didn't care about taking credit and who's going get to the, get the credit for the, everybody knows who he is anyway. His name's very prominent in the Bible. But anyway, so she understood mission. She took her main leader resource, didn't micromanage it. She showed up, did it his way. But you see, she stayed in her lane. When she showed up, she stayed in her prophetess lane and just nudged them and said, go on, you go be the general. I'm right here with you. Whatever they throw at you, they're throwing at me. Go on, be the general. Saul would have showed up on that battlefield and said, now that I'm here, I want the, uh, I'm going to have the uh, rocket throwers. I mean, I want, the, I want the archers over here and I want the chariots over there and we're going to march the infantry in this. He would have micromanaged the battlefield. He wouldn't have let his general be the general. So it, it, we, we talk about something called getting synergy from diversity. You got a perspective from your background. If you, as long as we, we are all focused on the mission, we all have the same value system. You bring your perspective to the table. I bring my perspective to the table. I'm going to show you this in a couple of weeks. Everybody gets about 80% of what they want. But we get 100% of the mission done. Make any sense? Let's move on. Mission, resources, and context. Okay, here's the cycle. There's a guy who was born in 1747. He died in the 1800s, obviously. His name was Titler. He was a lord or something like that over in England. He was a professor of a college. But he noticed he was a professor of Greek and Roman history. And he noticed that nations tend to go through a cycle. They, they, they win their wars and they, they, they stabilize their society and they start doing business with each other. Everybody can use their gifts and their talents. And so there's abundance. But then the nation goes complacent. They don't realize what the generation before had to fight through in order to win that freedom. So they start to make deals with the people that are going to destroy their freedom or, or ruin their blessings before God. And they, they get an apathy. You try to tell them, like, what are you talking about? God never did anything for us. And then they, go, they, get the, they grow in dependency and they, get, and they go into bondage. But in the book of Judges, it's done this way. There's peace in the land for 40 years or so. That's about a generational cycle. That's when the kids grow up and they get to run the things. The parents are 80, the kids get to take over. Peace in the land. But then the kids are like, ah, abundance and complacency, the apathy. They end up in sin and rebellion. They experience the consequences of that, so they cry out to God. God says, okay, I still love you, and he sends a rescuer. Repentance and rescue. And they get back on top of the cycle. There's eight of those in the book of Judges. I believe we could track cycles of judgment, uh, this in America too, based upon who our presidents have been. Why does God put it in the Old Testament? Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish, I came to fulfill. If you read the Bible right, you can figure things out. Most of our churches say, but we're not under the law, so we're not going to unpack that Old Testament. We don't need that. Well, you do. Right? Got this? I'm gonna, we're going to stick with this over the next few weeks because we're doing the book of Judges. So we'll have Gideon's name in here. We'll have Samson's name in here. We'll have Deborah's name in here. So we're gonna, instead of the cycles, we're going to keep we're gonna keep working off this diagram. That's why it's yellow. It's not in your notes. But see, God convicts us to repent and rebound. Failure is not final unless you don't rebound. 
You got to get back up, bounce back from bondage. That's what I'm trying to wake America up to. That's why we started Liberty Christian Fellowship Church. Let's go on. Now, the Bible's, this is cool. Look at the headline here. Judges shows what happens when we focus on our personal advancement, but we lack focus on our civic and cultural application. It's all about your gifts in church. I want to live my best life now, I do. But I don't want to live in the gulag because I'm not paying attention to things. The Bible's judges, they fought physical enemies, but they failed to deal appropriately with the spiritual, the spiritual uh, a problem of idol worship that brought the enemy in the first place. Like Old Testament Israel, our Christian American nation has abandoned the Lord because the church today is focused on self-help, personal advancement, time management, but completely ignores the Bible's civic and cultural applications that will determine whether you are going to have the freedom to live under the First Amendment or not. Separation of church and state was originally meant to keep the state from controlling the church. I was in uh, Dubai, United Arab Emirates, and a Palestinian said to me privately, I cannot stand what I'm living under. I'm suffocating. As people came in, he did not want to get caught saying something like that because you get your hand cut off for saying it. So as the class began, he said, um, you know why America works? It's because of separation of church and state. I said, no, 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 no. America doesn't work because of separation of church and state. China and Russia operate under separation of church and state where the state it feels no obligation to treat we the people or they the people according to the Ten Commandments. A lady in the back of the room from Kuwait said, what are the Ten Commandments? I thought, hmm, she's either trying to get me in trouble in here, or she's trying to keep, she's a closet Christian and she's trying to keep the discussion going. So I went to my flip chart and flipped a few pages back, just in case someone came into the room, I could flip a few pages down and hide it. And I began to write the Ten Commandments. I said, but you can think of them this way. And then I flipped the part again, I wrote the, ten, the positive paraphrases of the Ten Commandments. If you date right, you mate right. Mercy mitigates murder. You're not stealing. You're ripping both yourself and the other person out of God's plan for both your material blessings. And one of them said, and I said, those are your inalienable rights referenced in the Declaration of Independence. And one of them said, if that's the case, why don't you outlaw all the other religions? I was in New York City once, and a man from Africa, we went, went, went for a walk one night, and he says, how come the American army, if what you're saying is true, why doesn't the American army just start at one end of Africa and just march through the whole place and clean it out for us? I said, because CNN won't let us. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you have to be invited to do things like that. Can you imagine the death and the destruction? But Jesus is going to come, and the Bible says he's going to rule the nations with an iron fist. He's going to make you behave yourself. He's going to make you treat people according to the Ten Commandments, or you're going to pay a price. All right, let me ask some questions. Question one. Does the phrase separation of church and state actually appear in the Bible? No. No, because no, the Bible says I'm going to judge the nations, right? If God wanted to separate the church and state, he would not have drowned Pharaoh's army in the sea when that man led his state to disobey God. Does the phrase separation of church and state appear in the Declaration of Independence? No. Does it appear in the U.S. Constitution? No. Then why do churches cite it as if it is chapter and verse of the Bible? Indoctrination. Indoctrination. Wrong indoctrination. Let's move on. We need the Holy Spirit's conviction to keep us on top of the cycle. If you want to keep peace in your heart, you, you have to... We all sin, right? All right, so I'm a sinner. When I sin, I have a moment-by-moment -moment walk with God. 
If one moment I find myself out of God's will sinning, I stop, drop, and I put that fire out and I roll back to God. I, I, he's already forgiven me. All I got to do is confess my sin. I said, yes, Lord, I agree with your Holy Spirit. I agree with what your Bible says. Yes, I am thinking wrong thoughts. I appreciate your conviction. You want to you overcome your sin? Just say, God, I'm sick of doing this. I, I pray that make me sensitive to the Holy Spirit's conviction in my life. It's not a works pro. I don't have to grit my teeth and say, oh, I'm not going to sin. I just, he's the vine, we're the branches. Look at 1 Peter. 3, we're only going to go through 3 to 11, but verses 3 through 4 and 9. Look, it says, applying the Bible to life and godliness. Now, that word life does refer to your internal life. But it also means all of life. God is the God of the whole universe. When people say separation of church and state, I'm like, you better stop saying that because you're lying about God. You're saying God has separated himself from some part of his creation. And he's not doing that. Jesus said that a, a sparrow cannot fall. And the hairs of your head are numbered. Not very challenging for all of us, but some of us have a lot of hair. Some got better numbers. Some got better numbers, yeah. <laughs> so we need the Holy Spirit's conviction. Therefore, brothers, look, it says if you, if you don't do these things, you're, you are nearsighted. You can't see the big context. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. The Bible says, I like the King James, it says, make your calling and your election sure. He saved us. I'm certain of it. I don't walk around wringing my hands about society. I, I, was, I had a reunion with some of my coworkers and some of my military buddies this past couple of weeks. And someone said, well, our country's in such a mess and nobody knows what to do about it. I said, I know exactly what to do about it. God blessed the Mayflower Compact. God blessed a covenant. All we got to do is begin to rehonor it. We have to be born again ourselves. We have to be Bible-believing people committed to it. We have to know that our Democratic and our Republican parties have been deceiving us and they have not been giving us Bible-believing people who are so-called conservatives to run for office. All the dictators in the history of the world come to power on the promise that they will take care of the poor. Jesus said the poor shall always be with you. In other words, don't be duped by some guy who's going to stand in front of the government and say, I'm going to alleviate the poor. Because they're going to beat up on all the people that give people jobs and pull people out of poverty, and then they're going to make sure everybody's poor. That is the history of the world. It starts back in the book of Genesis. I'm going to be teaching this when we get to the Tower of Babel uh, in, uh, in down there in, Sco in Scotia. Scotia? Scotia. <laughs> you talk to people from other places. I go, is that Scotia? <laughs> anyway, let's move on. Now, Here's the challenge for us as a church, as a society. You know, the, what I'm struggling for is for society, Western civilization survival. I had a, 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 a high school teacher once, he said, you know, Western civilization is nothing more. I had a third grade and a fourth grade teacher that said the same thing. That Western civilization is nothing more than how Christianity civilized the Western world. The Eastern world kind of rejected it or got into other brands of Christianity, not biblical forms of Christianity. And so they kind of live in the chaos. Of, you're going to become like what you worship. The Pope is a world dictator. He's the dictator of a religion. And every communist country has an ordained version of the papal church the Russian Orthodox, whatever, that actually abuses the Bible-believing people within the society. But we don't know that because they call themselves Christians, so we don't look deeply enough to figure out what's going on. Anyway, here's our challenge. Three dimensions of leadership. The bride is in a battle to be faithful. The bride of Christ, that's the church, we're in a battle. Are we going to be faithful to God or are we going to start hanging out a rainbow flag? Even though in Genesis, God blows up the society that hangs out the rainbow flag. The bride of Christ is in a battle. I'm fully aware of that battle, are you? I know it's not, I'm okay, you're okay. I know that we're all lost without Jesus Christ. The family is in a fight to fulfill its biblical role. I met people at the funeral the other night who told me about their, their hardships of being a father, being divorced, and how the courts have separated men from their, from their children.
the Bible says God is a father. I really never had a good father. I had, a, I had a kind of a good stepfather, but he died early. But I had a pretty bad father. And so when someone first told me that God is your father and he loves you, I thought, that drunk? No, 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 no. Not, no. Not having anything to do with that guy. So the family is in a fight to fulfill its biblical role. The church is in a conflict to evangelize the culture. We, I've, I've worked in societies or been in churches for you see these missionaries for 20 years, 25 years. They say, well, no, the guy's got five wives. And we're like, why? Well, we're not there to change the culture. The Bible changes culture. If I become a Christian, I'm not going to be doing that. The Bible says you've got to be the husband of one wife. Anyway, let's pray and prepare for communion. Lord God, we thank you for being a God who loves us. And uh, I, we didn't choose to be born in such a time as this. I did not choose to be born at a time when my country would completely be going off the rails. But I thank you, Lord, that you've woken me up to it. And that you still have grace, you still have mercy for us, Lord. You're an amazing God. You can use us in such a time as this. So we want to turn our hearts to you in communion, Lord. And uh, as we continue our service, we ask you to meet us to convict us, to give us assurance of salvation, Lord. If you're here and you've never, if you, if you strayed from Christ, this is an opportunity to say, Lord, I'm, I, I, I'm going to trust you to bring me to you. There's some things going on in me that I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable with. I may not be happy about and I don't quite understand, but I do believe you're God. I do believe you love me. And I do believe you'll, you'll receive me. And though I, I can't really feel like I'm going to, I, 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 I can get it all, and I'm still kind of worried what will happen to me if I commit this way, I'm going to give you permission to speak to my heart, speak to my mind. I'm going to give you permission to convict me, to bring me to your truth. I'm going to ask you, the good shepherd, to open my eyes, my heart, my ears to your truth. I'll be a sheep if you reveal yourself to me as the good shepherd. I ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said. Here are the ABCs of communion. It's a time to affirm who God is as the great I am. It's kind of interesting that he calls himself the great I am. I mean, I'm the great now. I'm whatever you need now. Ever present. We acknowledge our human barrenness. Uh, in my flesh dwells no good thing. And we're thankful because we have this blessed assurance. Communion is also a time to pledge our commitment, pledge allegiance to the Lord, to acknowledge that I know that you died for my sins. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You have two cups, and in the bottom cup, you have your bread element. Let's eat. 